Amen. So Mark chapter 16, the Bible reads the verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you know, I haven't really had a, picked out a title for this evening for this morning's sermon, but really what I just want to talk to us about this morning is just some, maybe just some I uh, just to encourage you to participate in the soul winning that's here at Tucson. We're going to see why it's important that we go soul winning. And then just maybe some practical tips about uh, things to consider if you're new to soul winning or think maybe you're maybe you've been soul winning for a long time. You know, what is soul winning? What is it that we're doing? So I just want to talk a little bit about soul winning because soul winning to this church, to Faithful Word Baptist Church, is a, is a huge part of what we do. I mean, it's it's the it's the main work that this church does. There's, of course, the preaching, you know, that goes on behind the pulpit to help those that are saved and uh, attending the local church to, to grow in Christ and, and the grace and knowledge of Him. But what we do, the reason why we learn, the reason why we come to church, the reason why we want to develop our Christian life is also that we can go out and, and, and reach others. I mean, that's, that's the main thrust of what we're about here. And I would mention also that that's the main thrust of, of, of God. That's what He wants done. That's the work that God wants done. That's why a Faithful Word puts such an emphasis on soul wedding is because God puts a very big emphasis on soul winning. If you look there in verse 15, and he said, and this is one of the last things that Jesus Christ commanded his disciples, one of the last things he told them, gave them the Great Commission. You know, often people, they remember the last thing, the, the easiest, you, if you hear, go to a meeting or a seminar or even preaching, often it's the last thing that you hear that makes the biggest impression. So what was it that Jesus Christ wanted to impress upon his disciples before he, he left this earth? And he said to them in verse 15, Go ye into all the world. Go ye into all the world. You see, it's God's will that every person in the world hear the gospel. He didn't say, go ye into the immediate area. Go to wherever you feel like. He said, go into all the world. God wants the gospel to be preached throughout the entire world. That's His goal. That's His vision. And that's what we strive to do here at Faithful Word. That's something that we would love to see accomplished. Now, no one church is going to accomplish that goal. No one person is going to accomplish that goal. The world is just too big, too vast. But we have a part in accomplishing this task. And if we do our part, maybe others will catch on, catch on fire and do their part. You know, as a body, in a church, you know, individuals, you could say that. If, one, if a, you're going to church and you're seeing people going soul winning, it might rub off on others who are not. And then that church will rub off on other churches and they'll get inspired and motivated to go out and, 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 to, and to win souls. And that just spreads. And you can see that if, if people would just understand the importance of God's vision for preaching the gospel to the whole world, that they might all, that it might actually be accomplished if people would just understand that God wants the world to hear the gospel. He wants us to preach to every creature. You know, not not just to a certain nationality, not just to a certain group of people, not to just where it's convenient or where it's easy. He says he wants the gospel preached to every creature. Every creature needs to hear the gospel. You know, and a big part of the problem that we ha are, have not accomplishing that is that first word there. It's not being obeyed. Go. You know, we've allowed a lot of this Calvinistic thinking creep into our Baptist churches where they have this idea that God is just going to send the lost to them. That He's just going to bring them into the church house and sit them down and they're just going to be able to preach them down an aisle and get them to bow down at an altar and, and pray a prayer. And that's all fine and great if that would happen. But, you know, the model that I see in the in the in the, in the in the Bible, in the commandment that Jesus Christ gave His disciples is us going out there. He's telling us to go. He's telling us to leave the church house and go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in, not into the church, but into God's kingdom that His house may be full. God wants us to preach the gospel to every creature. Why is it that God wants the, the gospel preached to every creature? Well, simply it's because God, it's God's will that every person believe the gospel. God wants, to, wants us to preach the gospel to the entire world because God wants all men to be saved. He wants all men to be saved. Go ahead and turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this is important because this will help diffuse, as I said before, this Calvinistic thinking that if God wants somebody saved, that somehow they'll just get saved. Well, let me tell you something. God wants the whole world to be saved. But is the whole world going to get saved? I mean, that's what Calvinists will say. They'll think, oh, you know, if God wants them to be saved, it'll happen. Well, guess what? God wants the whole world to be saved. So if, so why aren't they all saved? It's because we're not doing our part. We're not going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Which is what we ought to do because of the fact that God wants every person to believe the gospel. God wants every person to be saved. Look at there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> who, will you, who will have all men to be saved? All men to be saved. 
and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus died and paid that ransom for sin for everybody. For everybody. He wants everyone to be saved. Go ahead and turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you're turning over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'll read to you from 2 Peter 3. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many does God want to come to repentance? All. How many people does God want to be saved? All of them. He doesn't want anybody to perish. 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer approach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. Why is it that we labor? Why is it that we'll go out as a church? Why is it that Faithful Word Baptist Church is just you know, dedicated to going out into all these different places, spending hours you know, reaching Phoenix, hours trying to reach Tucson, hours a week, all these different soul winning times, pushing people to go out, holding soul winning marathons throughout this country, going out into the you know, the, the reservations and preaching in some of the most obscure, just distant places in this state. The most rural, hard, hard to reach places you could find. Why is it that we labor? Why is it that we suffer reproach? Why is it that we're allowing ourselves to be criticized by the naysayers who say, soul winning doesn't work. Door to door gospel, soul winning doesn't work. Why is it that we do that? It's because, as it says there, we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. We understand that every single person on this earth is, has, has a Savior who died for them. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And He wants them to be saved. So we see that we have a big task and that we have a very important task to accomplish. We are to reach the whole world with the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But how are we going to accomplish that task? As I said before, no one church is going to do that. But what we have to learn to do as a body here in Tucson is understand that, that, that Tucson is our responsibility. That God has given us a charge, that we have a great work before us, and no, we might not reach the whole world, but let it not be said when we reach up the, the heaven, when we get to glory, that our Lord will look at us and say, you didn't reach who you could. Let, us, let it be said of us that we at least you know, attempted to reach our portion of the world, that we at least reach out to those that were in our area Amen. and see Tucson saved, as many as will receive Him. You'll see Tucson is, is the responsibility of Faithful Word Baptist Church, Tucson. That's why it's here. You know, of course, we want people to come out to church and grow and, 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 and learn. But we also want to inspire and others to go out and do the work that we've been given to reach Tucson with the gospel. You see, people have to take responsibility. If you would turn to chapter, Titus chapter 1. People have to take responsibility for evangelizing certain areas. People have to take responsibility. Somebody has to say, I, I'm going to carve out this little section of, of, of the world and take responsibility for it. You know, we've got a pastor, Pastor Anderson, who's got a big vision. You know, he wants to reach all of Phoenix. He wants to reach Tucson. He even wants to reach all the state of Arizona. And let me tell you, those plans are, 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 are in effect. And they're being carried out. I mean, we just knocked the Tohoda Odom Reservation. We've knocked every single door on that reservation. That's the second largest reservation in the state of Arizona. We've got, I think, uh, you know, 12 more to go. We, we're, I mean, we're just knocking the place out. And we're going to get it accomplished by the end of this year. Why? Because people are understanding that they have a responsibility to go out and preach the gospel to every creature in their area. That's what we need to have, to have done. You see, people have to take responsibility. It says there in Titus chapter 1, Verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. Of course, we have Paul here telling Titus, you know, he wants him to stay in Crete, and he wants him to establish churches and appoint elders, but to what end? That the gospel might be preached. He said, there was a cause that I left thee there. You know, there's a, if, if, if we're saved and God didn't have anything else for us to do, why, why did he leave us here? Why are we left here in Tucson? Why are we on this earth? Why don't we just go home to glory? Because God wants us to set in order the things that are wanting. He wants a church established and He wants us to go out and, and, and reach every city. Amen. Amen. Now, we see, I don't think anyone here is going to question the task that we've been given from Scripture. I think just Mark 16 alone is enough. I mean, how much more proof do you need from the words of Jesus Christ that He wants us to preach the gospel to every creature? I think we all understand that. 
But he also gives us, and if you took, would turn over to Luke chapter 10, he gives us a biblical example, I believe, and how we're going to accomplish this practically. Because you know, it's a big job. It's a big job, but there's a practical way to get it done. Luke chapter 10, if you would. Luke chapter 10, beginning of verse 1. The Bible says in Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 1, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two, two, two and two before His face into every city and place, whither He Himself would come. If we're going to accomplish this goal of reaching Tucson with the Gospel of Christ, the first thing I want us to notice is that you have to have an appointment. You have to have an appointment. Notice it says there that the Lord appointed them. He said, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to go. This is who I want you to go with. There was an appointment. There was a set time that they went out and did this. He didn't say when you get around to it. <coughs> they were appointed. <coughs> you have to have an appointment. If we're going to reach the city of Tucson with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to have a scheduled time for soul winning. You know, you're more likely to get something done if you actually sit down and schedule a timeout. If you say, at this time, during this day, you know, I'm going to do this no matter what. You know, people find uh, time to get things done that they want to get done. You know, if we get a burden for the lost and desire to fulfill the Great Commission, then you know what we would do? We would sit down and say, I am going to go soul winning at this time. Now, here at the church, as I mentioned in the announcements, you know, we have two dedicated times. That if a person wants to help fulfill the Great Commission, there's already a time established that you can go out and do that. Sundays at 1.30, we're right here at the building, 1.30 afternoon. We meet every Sunday, faithfully. There's always someone here that's going out and going to preach the gospel. And then again, Thursdays at 5.30. You know, these are consistent times that you can count on. You know, and as the church grows, you know, I believe that we'll have more times added. And not everybody, you know, not everyone's schedule works with those times. But, you know, I'm sure that if, 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 that if they didn't, you know, we could probably find a time. We could probably find somebody that would be willing to take you out and go soul winning. But you can count on Sundays at 1.30. You can count on Thursdays at 5.30. <clears throat> and this is a big reason why people need a local church. You know, people want to get, they get on fire. I remember when we first, you know, found Pastor Anderson online back in Michigan. We were part of a church. You know, they did other means to go out and, and try to reach others with the, with the gospel. But they didn't have a time set aside where they went out for the express, purses, express purpose of asking a person at their door within the first you know, 10 to 30 seconds, do you know for sure that if you die today, you go to heaven? And they have, we have all, you know, Baptist churches have every, all these other means that, today that they want to do. They want to do everything else but soul winning. And they want to call that evangelizing. They've got the bus routes. You know, they've got, you name it. There's all kinds of things out there. But we believe here in going out and knocking on the door and asking that person to their face, not after having getting to know them, not after taking time out of our schedule, being their friend and sitting down with them. Those are all fine and good things to do. But we, but with, we go out there to confront them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to ask them that question. Do you know that you go to, go to heaven if you die today? And we, That's what we wanted to do. When my, my wife and I found out about Pastor Anderson, we, we saw somebody that was serious about soul winning. I mean, we were very involved in a local church that that wasn't doing that. And we thought, well, maybe maybe we could start that here. Maybe we could do that here. But let me tell you something. It's hard to get that done. It's hard for you to go ahead and do it all on your own, to go out and, and, and uh, take on that task of soul winning if you don't have a local church. You need the local church to send you out. Notice there again in verse 1, it says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them. You see, it was somebody else, it was another authority, it was somebody else appointed them, and what did he do? He sent them. He sent them out. Don't underestimate the importance of the local church. This is huge. This is, this is something people need to understand. And people today, even saved Christians, are forsaking the assembly. They're saying, you know what, we're just going to do house church. And they've got all these crazy reasons of why they don't want to be in God's house. But we need to be in the local church. Why? So that we can be sent. Amen. If you would, turn over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I want to just read to you from Ephesians 5. To just, you know, as kind of a side note to, at this time, just kind of impress upon your minds the importance of the local church. You're turning over to Romans chapter 10. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Jesus Christ loves the church. 
and gave himself for it. I mean, the God of all glory, the Son of God came down and gave himself for the local church, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it by the, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. He did that so that he could, he bought this church, he purchased the church, he sanctified the church, he cleansed the church. Why? That he could present it to himself, a glorious church, having not not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Amen. Jesus Christ paid a great price for the local church. That's how important it is. And people ought not be forsaking the assembly of the local church. Why? One, because, you know, it cost our Lord, you know, his, his own dear life. But also, because there's a work to be done, and that work is most effectively done when it's done through the local church, the work of soul winning. You see, soul winning is much more likely when it is done under the authority and direction of the local church. You know, the apostles were much more likely to go out and do some soul winning when Jesus sent them. When he pushed them out the door, he said, you know, I mean, think about it. If you're walking around with the Lord, you know, as one of these apostles and these disciples, what do you want to just hang around Jesus all the time? What's he going to do next? See a miracle? Maybe get a free lunch? You know, he's always feeding people. I mean, who wouldn't want to just stay with Jesus all the time and just dwell there? But he said, hey, you know what? I'm glad you love me. I'm glad you want to be with me. But there's also work to do. You need to go. And he sent him out. And that's what we need. We need a local church to send us out. Look at Romans chapter 10. If I had to turn there. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? You know, you're a lot more likely to get something done soul winning and go out and preach the gospel as someone's there to send you. If a preacher's going to get up and say, hey, you need to go out soul winning. Here's when we go soul winning. Let me show you how to go soul winning. Let me show you what it takes to do some soul winning. You see, the local church doesn't just send you out. It also helps you in soul winning in several different ways. The local church will provide you with partners for soul winning. He will provide you for partners. And if you would, just keep something in Luke 10. I should have told you that. We're going we're gonna to be looking at Luke 10, verse 1, because there's a lot just in that one verse that we can learn about soul winning. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. The local church provides partners for soul winning. Notice when Jesus sent them, He didn't send them out as individuals. He didn't send them out one by one. What did He do? He says there that He sent them out two and two. Two and two. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before His face. That's how we sent Him out. That was the model that Jesus Christ gave us when He sent out His disciples to preach Him. And I believe that model is very important. I don't think He just came up with that number just, you know, just to have a number. That there was a very, some very good reasons why He chose to go two and two. And one of those is... Uh, because of the fact that it, I think it's much more effective to have two people. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. You know, when you have a soul winning partner to go with you, you know, they kind of keep you from getting distracted. You understand it's not just your time that's out here out there. You're out there with somebody else's time. And then you need to be effective. You need to be efficient in your soul winning and not waste time. You know, you can learn a lot of things from, from other people. You can learn what works and what doesn't work. It goes on there and says uh, in Ecclesiastes 4, For if one fall, they will lift up his fellow. You know, another great thing being sent out two by two is the encouragement that you receive. You know, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for there hath not another to help him. You know, you might be out there soul winning and you have a bad door, somebody's got a bad spirit, and don't let that scare you away. Don't, you know, and I remember when I first started, I would be so nervous about that. About having some jerk at the door. You know, is she going to say something nasty or, or just, you know, be, be annoyed that you're there. That's going to happen. But you know what? I, you got to just learn to, 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 to shake the dust off your feet and move on. And a soul winning partner will help you do that. You know, that's one thing I always try to do. If I ever am out there and, and somebody, you know, it's the other person's turn to talk and they knock on the door and they have a, a bad experience, you know, someone's just being nasty at the door, whatever, rude. And, you know, the temptation is to walk away and get in the flesh and just, oh, you know, that jerk, you know, and just think all the things. But as a soul winning partner, when I see that happen to my partner, when they go through that, I immediately try to get their mind on something else. You know, I try to talk to them, try to keep a conversation going so you can forget it. I mean, we should try it because as human beings, I remember being told this, uh, you know, when I was working in customer service is that we always tend to remember the bad experiences. 
You know, if you work with customers, you never remember that great customer who came in and was very helpful and kind and patient and was appreciative of your, of your work. You always remember that mean, nasty person who came in and had nothing to do but complain and go to the manager and give you a hard time. I mean, those are the people you remember. So when we're out, you know, soul winning, often, you know, that's, that's easy to do. We get a bad door. We get discouraged. We say, man, what a jerk. And we're, going, we're taking that spirit to the next door, that attitude, that discouragement as we go and knock on the door. Oh, here, is it going to be another one of those jerks? You know, that's why as a silent, or not a silent partner, but as a soul winning partner, when you go with somebody, you can make it a point to encourage them. Say, hey, you know, forget about that guy. And, and the more you do that, the, the more natural it becomes. I mean, I've gotten to the point now where people people are jerk. I didn't see it, and I just go on. And I, I really doesn't even faze me hardly anymore. But that's something that you grow into, and I believe that's something that a good soul winning partner will help you with. That they won't sit there and you know encur you know they, they'll encourage you to just move on. They won't say, "Boy, you're right. That guy was a jerk," you know, and and you, you know it just carries on. But that's some good reasons why. The model of going out two by two is, a, is important. Another reason would simply be because of safety. I mean, simply because of safety. I mean, we were out soul winning on the, out in Peridot yesterday. I've had a big group out there. And we're out on the uh, uh, San Carlos um, Indian Reservation. Let me tell you, those people are living a rough life out there. There's some people out there that need to hear the gospel. I mean, if you've never been on one of these soul winning reservation trips, I'd at least you to take, take, take one. You take one trip on with us. You know, we, we always schedule them out, and I'll try to start, I'll be including that schedule in, in, the, in the announcements and things, and we'll be able to schedule that out. we got one coming up on, on, uh, on uh, the 21st of this month, on, uh, on, on Monday. You know, everyone's going to have the day off, and we can go out there, too. There's one real close to Fountain Hills in Phoenix, on the uh, Fort McDowell Yavapai. You know, we can go out there and do it. But you get on some of these, these Indian reservations like we did yesterday, man, it's important to stay safe. I mean, I remember I went to one neighborhood the week prior in that same neighborhood out there in that same reservation, and I found the drug house. I found where the res was buying all their drugs at. I found out where they were getting all the, the meth that's being smoked out there. Because we're soul winning, and they're right in the middle of this neighborhood. I mean, they got this one house. I mean, the guy's knocking on the door. A guy pops out. You know, they're, they're doing this. Back turn, and the guy turns around and leaves. He wasn't there for a cup of sugar. And you got every, every, every 30 seconds, someone's pulling up and pulling away. I mean, in just five minutes, I must have seen half a dozen people come and go from that one house. Had a, had a, had a car of young guys pull away from that house, yep, saying something to me, you know, and, and you know, I, don't, I try not to provoke people or anything like that. I'm just looking away, and then they come up to where we were at the driveway, rolling down the window, and, you know, eyeballing me. It could be dangerous. You know, I don't want to scare everybody, you know, from so in, and now nobody's going to go. But it is something to be aware of. You know, you need to stay safe out there. That's why it's important to go two by two. You know, when I said the guy, after that, I said, when we came back the following week, I said, I'm putting two teams in there. So I got four guys in there. You know, and, and, and we're going to, if anything goes on, we're going to have four guys who are going to be able to watch out for each other. And we're going to leapfrog the houses so that we're all in proximity. You know, we need to think about how we go soul winning. There's a reason why we go two by two. There's a reason why we leapfrog in certain areas. There's a reason why, you know, certain areas should be done by, you know, maybe the men. I think this is very important for, for ladies. You know, that if women are going out, I would even like to see three, you know, three teams or, you know, at least two groups of two women going out soul winning. I think if they're going to go out soul winning together, and they should, that they need to stay safe. And maybe the guy who's kind of planning out the soul winning should keep that in mind. That if there's some ladies that want to go soul winning at some time, if they can carve out some time in their busy schedule, you know, these mothers and things like that that want to go out and do some soul winning, that they should send them to an area where they're not going to have to worry about, you know, knocking on the local crack house. But they should go to a place maybe that's not as receptive, but at least they're going to be safe. So that's another big reason why we send people out two by two. It says there in Ecclesiastes, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily, not quickly broken. It's always good to have that partner there in case something goes on. So we see, first of all, you know that we see this biblical example that Jesus is giving us in Luke chapter ten about how you know how we ought to go soul winning. One is, you know, one thing we ought to do is we ought to determine when we're going to go soul winning. What soul winning time are we going to go to? When during our lives, what time during the week are we going to carve out and do an hour of soul winning? Or, and once we figure that out, we, we get to learn that we're going to go out two by two. But I also want us to understand, you know, that's great. Those are the logistics that are involved. But something that people need to understand is that you are responsible for your preaching of the gospel. You're responsible for how you preach the gospel out there. You know, we went out there and had a great day yesterday 
on, uh, on the Indian Reservation up there in Paradox. I had about, I think I had eight teams out there. We had 31 people saved. You say, well, how, could that, how is that possible? Well, you know, when you go out for five hours with people who know how to preach the gospel, everyone's a talker in a receptive area, that's not uncommon. I mean, it's the, it, it, I mean that's the simplicity that is in Christ. That is the, that's the love that God commended toward us, that He hath made the, the gospel so easy to believe that if a man would just, with the Holy Spirit inside him, would just open up the book and just preach to him the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, that it's by belief, you know, it's by grace through faith that we're saved and not of works. And you know, the gospel's easy. You know, living the Christian life's hard. It can be difficult, it can be the struggle. We'll go to heaven. God made that easy. Why? Because he commended his love toward us. That's how much God loves us. He made it easy. So if you go to an area, you can get numbers like that. But let me say this. I trust every last one of those people that are reporting me are reporting me an, uh, an accurate number. But as somebody who leads soul winning, I'm not going to go around and make sure every, you know, follow up on all of these numbers. I just say, you know what? If you're going to go out and preach the gospel, you're responsible for how you preach it. And whatever you come number you come back with, that's on you. <clears throat> you are responsible how you preach the gospel before God. Notice there it says in Luke 10, after these things, verse 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two by two before His face. You see, God sees everything we do, and your soul winning is no exception. When you're going out there, He's paying attention to how you're preaching the gospel. You know, you're going to give an account one day for your works here. Lord, keep something in Luke 10. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 3. We will give an account to God for our works here. We will give an account. So that's why it's important that we understand how to preach the gospel. That we're thorough, that we're effective, and we take the time that needs to be taken to make sure a person understands how, how to, uh, what, it, what it takes to believe and understands the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. You know, all the numbers that are coming in, I pray every last one of them is accurate. And there might be people that we count that were just telling us what we wanted to hear. Here. But there might have been other people that we didn't count that actually did get saved. People that, you know, we couldn't lead to the Lord right then and there, but maybe later, they did get saved. And these things all balance out. And we get criticized for counting. You know, and, I, and counting to me is not the biggest deal in the world. I don't feel the need to make sure everybody knows how many people I got saved or didn't get saved. You know? But I'll tell you what, I, I'm, not, I'm all for counting, and so is God. I mean, he's got a book called Numbers. He does a lot of counting in the Old Testament. And there's nothing, I mean, he counts in the New Testament... You know, there was 5,000 added on the church, 3,000, you know, and such as should be saved. God's given the numbers. So I'm not against it, but I'm just saying that you're responsible for that number, whether or not it's right. And every work, every man's work shall be made manifest. You know, I got, I got 12 people, I got 10. Praise the Lord. One day God's going to try that and see if that's really true. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So we're not going to, it's not that we just get to report a number here and just, you know, because I believe, you know, it's possible. I don't know anybody that does this. I don't believe anybody does. I always give people the benefit of the doubt. But is it possible someone just likes to report a number? When the preacher calls out and said, you know, at the beginning of the service, it says, let's count up our soul winning for the week. They just like that feeling they all raise their hand. I got five. You know. Hey, praise the Lord. It's a good feeling to have soul winning numbers report, isn't it? It's a blessing to that you went out during the day and won somebody to the Lord. And that you have you can come back, you know, knowing that you've helped somebody escape the fires of hell. That's what the blessing is. It's not to be seen of men. <clears throat> so it's possible there might be somebody that does that, but I'm gonna tell you what, one day their work shall be made manifest. So that's you are responsible for your preaching the gospel. And to that end, you need to learn how to give the gospel. That's why it's important to learn how to give it. Because you're responsible for how you do it. And if you don't know how to give the gospel, this is a great place to learn how to go out and do some soul winning. If you've never done soul winning before, you're in a great church to learn how to go out and, and reach the lost with the gospel. The best way to learn is by learning how to give it from how other people are giving it. Go out and observe how other people do it. And that's why we encourage people here to be a silent partner. You know, we send out people two by two, but that doesn't mean both people have to do the talking. 
You know, if you're someone who's not, you know, not maybe not comfortable doing the talking, you know, don't know how to give the gospel yet, you're trying to learn, you know, go out and be a silent partner. That's how I learned. You know, when I got here six years ago, my first soul winning partner was, was Pastor Stephen Anderson. And I had many others after him. And I learned something from every one of those people. And I took my time and I, I did everything that I needed to do until I gained that confidence where I felt like, you know what, I, could, I, I am ready to preach the gospel to these people. And I started to do talking. Now let me say this about silent partners. First of all, I emphasize the silent in silent partners. Okay? A silent partner is to be a silent partner. You know, and, and people try, and I understand people get excited and I, you know, I've been out with people and I've been preaching and I'm talking to the individual and this guy's kind of like, yeah, yeah, you know, he's piping up, just throwing in a few words here and there. That's not silent, okay? A silent partner is there to watch how it's done, take notes, and to be quiet until they're ready to talk. That's why when I go to, you know, if I'm going with somebody else who talks, we trade off door to door. You know, when, when it's their turn to talk, I, you know, unless they look at me and act like, hey, what do you think, you know, or... The, the person doing the talking asked me to, to put interject. I, I, I don't say anything. I mean, not a word. I pray, you know, silently in my heart. I don't pray out loud. You know, I don't take a knee. But I'll pray. And, uh, you know, and, and that's how, that's what it means to be a silent partner, to be silent. Let me say this about silent partners. There's no time limit on being a silent partner. You know, I was talking to a guy recently, and uh, he was asking about how long, it, it, you know, he's allowed to be a silent partner. I said, you can be a silent partner the rest of your life. That's fine with me. And I believe that that's a blessing. And I believe that there will be a reward for the person who's willing to at least go out and be a silent partner. There's no time limit on it. And we should never put pressure on people to do the talking. You know, I've been guilty of this in the past, of just kind of prodding people. So, you ever thought about doing the talking? You know, and I, but I don't ever want to come across as like, hey, you should start talking soon. You know, I'm getting a little wore out. You know, we need more people to talk. What's up? What's taking you so long? You know, this kind of just, you know, putting pressure on people. I mean, try to encourage people. Say, hey, what have you thought about it? What, what, what are your concerns? What can I do to help you to feel more confident doing the talking? But never this, you know, I'm going to give you a deadline or it's time for you to start doing the talking. There is no time limit on being a silent partner. And I'll also say this about silent partners. I'm wary of anybody who starts soul winning without having been one. Somebody who just comes out and just right out of the gate, you know, they, they show up at church and they're just, they've never been soul winning. They've never, they've never done it on a consistent basis. They've never learned how to do it from somebody else. They're just right out of the gate. Now, I'm not saying people can't go out and do a great job and, and learn, you know, right away. But I'll tell you what, it, I'm wary of somebody who skips that step. Who doesn't have enough humility and to say, well, maybe I need to learn a few things about how to go soul winning. We need to learn how to go soul winning. One great way is to be a silent partner and to go out and see how, how somebody somebody does it. We've got men in this room, self-included, that's exactly how they did it. You know, ladies too that, that have gone out, and I've, I've even watched men in this room go out with me that were silent partners, and now today they're doing the talking. Praise the Lord for that. Because you can't undervalue, you can't uh, don't underestimate the value of a silent partner. I mean, just do the math. If we have if we have two people that are talkers, two people who can both preach the gospel, and then we have two people show up who don't, who are silent partners. Well, now instead of two teams, we got four. Now we've got more people to go out and preach the gospel. That's the value of a silent partner. Oh, I'm just a silent partner. No, you are a helpful uh, element. You are you know something somebody that can be used of God to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't underestimate it. Now, to help you learn how to preach the gospel, this is what I always tell my silent partners. And, and, I, and I hope people do this. Is You need to you listen to sermons that have been preached about soul winning. I mean, praise the Lord, we have a pastor who's on top of technology, who's lever, leveraging you know, the, the technology that we have available to the glory of God. And would to God that more Baptists would get this through their head at these churches and start putting their preaching out and start putting out more resources for God's people to, to on you know on the internet and things like that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the world's using it. The world's taking that stuff by storm and using it for their own ends. But you need to go and listen to sermons that have been preached about soul winning. I mean, we have a pastor who's preached multiple sermons about how to be a better soul winner, where to start with going soul winning. And here's the two two sermons I recommend that every silent partner listen to. 
And I've been meaning to, and I need to remember to, to ask Pastor Anderson if we can burn off some copies of this, these, and just have them ready on hand at all times to just put in somebody's hand. And that's Soul Winning Instructions 1 and 2. Soul Winning Instructions Part 1, Soul Winning Instructions Part 2. How do I find the sermon, you ask? Well, if you go on Faithful Word Baptist Church, uh, Faithful Word Baptist, I can't even remember the Faithful Word Baptist, just Google it, you'll find the website. It's on our invites. You go there, you go over to the Preaching tab on the main page, and you click on that, you'll see the whole list, every, all the sermons that have been preached going all the way back to 2006 with MP3 that you can download, with YouTube links, with other, you know, SoundCloud, if, that, if, if you use that. It's all there. You're just one click away from a sermon. Just a couple clicks. You just get to that preaching page, and you say, well, that's a lot of sermons to have to go through. You're right. And that's why right at the top of that list, there's a little search bar. And if a person were just to go to that page and go to that search bar and type in the word soul, you would see it would filter out all the titles that have the word soul in it. And you would find soul winning instructions one and two. You'd find several other sermons that are directed towards learning how to go soul winning. And again, it's important that you learn how to go soul winning because you're responsible for your soul winning before God and how effective you are and how well you're doing it. And it's your responsibility, as it is all of ours, to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. So, oh, I don't have time to go listen to that sermon. Well, you know what? There's a great job that's been given to us. We need to be effective at it. People need to learn how to go soul winning, and this is a great way to do it. And it blows my mind how many people, they just don't want to do it. They just don't want to learn how to do it. And I'll tell them, go listen to these sermons. Because I'll tell you what, you know how I learned to go soul winning? Those sermons were the, the probably one of the biggest things that helped me. And I've been soul winning. And uh, I do a lot of the same things. I mean, the, out of that, my, the way I go through the gospel is almost identical to that. And we're going to get out of the minute, get to that in a minute. And when you listen to those sermons, here's what I recommend. Do what he does. What he tells you to do. Map out your Bible. How do I remember where to turn in my Bible? Well, you know you're going to Romans 3.10, right? That's what, Romans 3.10, some people go right to Romans 3.23. You know, that's the first place. If you could just remember that, put a bookmark there, you know, highlight it, highlight the verses you're going to use. Well, I go to Romans 3.23 and I have it highlighted. And then in pencil, right next to it, I have the reference, Romans 6.23. So now I already know that after I'm done reading that and explaining that verse, I'm just going to turn to Romans 6.23. And Romans 6.23 is highlighted in my Bible. You know, right next to that is my next scripture, scripture reference where I'm going to go. You know, Revelation 20.14, Revelation 21.8, John, or, uh, you know, uh, 2 Corinthians, or Romans 5.8, you know, and so on and so forth. But every, I have a map in my Bible. And if you don't understand what I'm, what I'm trying to explain, I'll just come see me after service and I'll show you right from my own Bible how I've done it. The other thing I would, people need to do, especially when you're starting out, is use a proven presentation of the gospel. Don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. Don't feel like you have to have your own unique way of preaching the gospel. You know, why not use a tried and, tr and proven method? <clears throat> you see, it's not, it's effectiveness and efficiency is what matters out soul winning. That you have an effective and efficient soul, uh, gospel presentation that covers the points, that explains the points thoroughly, that can bring a person to the understanding, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what you're trying to do. You're not trying to impress your soul winning partner. I'm not impressed. When people have their own way of doing things, I'm not impressed. I remember one of the first times, years ago, in fact, it was the first Indian soul winning reservation we did. It was with Pastor Jonathan Shelley. At that time, he was brother yeah. Jonathan Shelley. And I remember I went, I, had gone, I, I gave somebody the gospel, and we were walking away from the door. He said, man, that was really refreshing. I said, what? He says, it was nice to see somebody just use that plain old Romans road. And I said, amen. I wish I'd see more of it too. There's nothing wrong with it. It works. You know, everyone you know, thinks, well, that's the way Pastor Anderson did it. It's true, but you know what? That's, he didn't make up that. He didn't make that up either. He learned it from somebody else. He probably learned it from somebody else. You know, it, it, you don't have to sit there and come up with your own unique, just impressive way of presenting the gospel. The important thing about presenting the gospel is it needs to be efficient and it needs to be effective. And that's why I strongly recommend that you map out your Bible and that you listen to Soul Winning Instructions 1 and 2. And another great thing too is once you have that mapped out and you've listened to these sermons and, and, and you're starting to get a feel and you've been a silent partner and you kind of get a feel for what needs to be said and how certain questions that need to be asked, practice at home. Practice by yourself. Practice with a spouse or a loved one, somebody in your family. Just say, hey, can you pretend to be unsaved for a second? See if I can win you the Lord. You know, you don't need to go knock on your own door. 
But you can sit there right in your living room and say, hey, you know, just go through it. I mean, my wife, when she's getting ready to go soul winning, I'll see her over in the park. She's like, I mean, what are you doing? She's like, I'm going through my soul winning. And she practices what she's going to say, how she's going to say it. You know, and praise the Lord for that. And that's what we need. Why? Because not because she's trying to impress anybody, because she wants to be effective. She wants to be efficient. That should be the desire of our heart when we go soul winning. see where I am at for time. I'll move on to my next point here in this is that when you're preaching the gospel, you know, to, to the end, to the point of, you know, using proven presentations, something else I want to say about that is use the same gospel for everyone. You know, of course we know what I mean by that is we don't believe in there's, you know, seven or four different gospels like dispensationalists. Amen. You know, we believe there's one gospel that there's one name under heaven we're given among men where we lie, we must be saved. But what I mean by that is use the same gospel presentation. You know, I got caught up in this early on. Well, when I run into a Mormon, I'm going to address this, and I'm going to address this, and I'm going to address this. I'm just going to break them down and pick them apart. You know what I found out? Mormons are really hard to get saved because they're incredibly agreeable. You know, you really, it's hard to pin them down. They're very some of the squirreliest people. I think, well, when I'm preaching a Mormon, I'm going to present my gospel like this. When I'm preaching to a you know, a Catholic, it's going to be like this. If I get a Jehovah Witness, I'm going to cover this. You know what I realized real quick? Is that they all believe the same thing. So, oh yeah, their doctrines might be different. They might say different things and have different practices, but they all believe the same thing. They all believe in work salvation. They all believe that you got to be baptized and catechized and homogenized and pasteurized. And you got to do all the isms and this and that and take the sacraments and you know, do good works and and be a good person and follow the commandments, repent of your sin, and do all these things they have to do, all these things that they add to works or add to salvation. That's what they believe. So all I need to preach to them is the gospel of grace through faith. That's it. They all get the same presentation. You know, I, I ask them, well, what do you believe a person has to do in order to go to heaven? I don't, I don't ask that question in order to, to try and, you know, dismantle their thinking. I just try and gauge where they are in their understanding. And most people say the same thing, be a good person, or something to that effect. You know, which, which, you know, it all comes down and boils down to it. If you want to interpret that answer that they give you, be a good person, work salvation. That's what it always comes down to. So I give the same gospel presentation to everybody. Now, sometimes, of course, people are different, and you develop a feel for it, and you have to address certain things at different times, but by and large, just preach the same gospel to everybody, just the same gospel presentation. Excuse me. Just moving along real quick. I want us to. Uh, I want us to well, turn over to First Corinthians chapter one because I want to drive this in with some scripture. You know, it's the same gospel presentation for everybody, and it doesn't have to be your. You know, everyone. <clears throat> I don't see anything wrong. You know, if a person's got an effective and efficient means of presenting gospel that differs from mine. Somebody else is fine. All I care is that it works. But I just don't want people to feel like they have to come up with their own thing. You know, I've been preaching and using the same method for years now, and I learned it from somebody else who's been doing it for years. We learned it from somebody else that's been doing it for years. So I don't feel like fixing what, they, what isn't broke. But some people, if they want to do their own, that's fine. But I think we should all probably start from the same place. You know, if you're a beginner coming into it, I mean, that's kind of an overwhelming task. I'm just going to come up with a brand, my own unique soul winning presentation as a, as a brand new soul winner. That might be a little bit more intimidating than it needs to be. It's the same gospel for everyone. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For that after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. <coughs> He says in verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. He's saying there's these two people. This is what they want. This is what it takes for them to believe. This is what they're looking for. The Jews want a sign. You know, that's not what they said to Jesus. You know, show us a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. You know, they're all into their philosophy and, and all these other things. But what did he say in verse 23? So we, we, we give them signs. And we give them wisdom. He said, no. But we preach Christ crucified. 
For under the Jews a stumbling block, and under the Greeks foolishness. But under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. We preach the same gospel to everybody, no matter what it, they believe. Okay. Lastly, on our last point, is I want us to understand the seriousness of soul winning. I want us to understand how important it is that we get involved in soul winning in our local church. This is what we're here to do. And this is important. Look at Luke chapter 10 again, if you would. Hope you kept something there. Luke chapter 10, look at verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed unto others seventy also, and sent them two and two before His face into every city and place, whither He Himself would come. And isn't that a beautiful picture of what we do? God sends us out, and we go out, and we preach the gospel to these people. And then He Himself comes, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of the preaching of God's Word, He comes and indwells them. Just as Jesus came behind His disciples, He comes behind us today and resides in the hearts of those that believe the gospel that we preach. Amen. That's the importance and the seriousness of soul winning. We're literally preparing the way for Christ to come to these people and, 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 and abide in them. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to wit that God was Christ, uh, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God has committed unto us, me and you, the people in this church, the word of reconciliation. It's our job to go out and reconcile Tucson, Arizona, to God. That's what has been committed unto us. That's a big task. It's a serious task. Soul winning isn't just a hobby. It isn't just something that we do to feel good about ourselves. It's something that God has committed unto us. It's an important task. It's serious. It goes on and said, Now that we are ambassadors for Christ. I mean, think about an ambassador for the, to the UN, somebody that we would send in there. You think that's a, you know, you just pick up any old guy off the street and just, hey, you're going to be the ambassador. I mean, you have to have some serious, you know, uh, letters behind your name, probably. You probably have to have some serious education. Be a real professional, know how to handle yourself. You have a very important job representing the most powerful nation on earth. You know, we're, we're going out and we are representing the most powerful kingdom in the world, in the universe. We're representing the King of Kings. We're His ambassador. So that's how important it is that we're doing what we're doing. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. You know, when you're out there and you're opening up the Bible and you're going through your presentation, it's not just you just, you know, going through some motions. At least it shouldn't be. What that is, is God beseeching that person at the door by you. God is using you to, to beg that person, to beseech that person to be saved. Amen. And that ought to be our heart when we, when we go to that door. Not just, let's get it over with, let's get our hour in so I can get back to what I'm doing. Understand, when you're going out soul winning, God is beseeching the lost through you through the preaching of His Word. Amen. goes on and says, We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Jesus Christ isn't going to come down here and preach the gospel to the world. We're going to do it in His stead. We pray you in Christ's stead. You know, He's already done all the hard work. He's the one that came down here, lived a perfect and sinless life, was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He is the one that when he was tortured and crucified and rose again, he's already done all that work. And what's he asked us to do? Just go tell them about it. Just go tell them what I have done. And we and we get all timid because someone's gonna, some atheist is gonna get mad at us. Ooh, so scary. I'm more afraid of God disapproving me when I stand before Him. Why didn't you go and reconcile? Why didn't you go in my stead and beseech them as I appointed you to do? I'm more afraid of that than what some, some God-hater is going to say to me at the door. Get out of here. See ya. I love it when they get mad right away and blow their top and tell me to leave. Because I don't want to waste my time. Because I tell you what, uh, there's somebody out there. There's somebody out there today that if someone would just bring them the gospel and preach it to them effectively and efficiently and thoroughly, they would believe. God would beseech them on, through us if we would just go. See, we are gone before Him today. We are gone before the Savior today. We are gone before Christ. We've been appointed. We've been sent. We are gone before Him. 
And we are to try to bring them, him to them, and have them meet here through his word. But I'm telling you something. The seriousness of souling is that one day they will come before him. One day they will stand before him. He would turn over to Revelation chapter 20. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. If they don't meet Christ here through us, they will meet Him one day in judgment. <coughs> Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says, And the devil, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. My friend, the gospel, the preaching of it is important because one day they will all stand before God. Let's bring, let's have them meet now. Amen. Let's go and introduce them to the Savior today so they don't have to meet them then. Let's go ahead and pray.